Hello from the Clio Cloud Conference online everywhere in the world. I'm Lawrence Coletti. And I'm Jack Newton. And we're on the road with Legal Talk Network. And we're back. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. And of course, we're with our good friend, Jack Newton, the CEO and founder of Clio. Welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're looking forward to this. You know, I don't think we've seen you since ABA Tech Show, which is uh, ironically the last conference we've been to before the pandemic hit. And then all the conference, uh, all the conferences got canceled. And now this is our first online conference that we're covering. So, you know, just kind of some bookends of events there. So I'm really glad we got a chance to catch up. We have that in common. The ABA Tech Show was the last physical conference I was at as well. And that feels like a geological era ago to be. (laughs) I I think it was late February, wasn't it? Something like that. I remember we were gearing up for another trip and then everything just stopped and it was the world got turned upside down and it's just been a a weird roller coaster ride ever since. So that is a understatement of the year. (laughs) Well, let's get into that. I definitely want to catch up with you. So I I know like uh, your organization, like many had to do some pivots and I know that uh, you you had these orders to go out your entire workforce, which is quite a few. Are you guys over 300 now, right? Over 300 strong? We're we're over 500. Over 500. So you sent everybody home over 500 employees uh home and it's uh, right. in more than one country so several offices but uh that's you know, right. t- tell us about those pivots early on and some of the other pivots and changes that you've been making just just your organization get everybody caught up yeah absolutely so back on march 13th we decided to shut down our five worldwide offices and and those are offices in vancouver where headquarters is calgary alberta toronto ontario Los Angeles, California, and Dublin, Ireland. And uh, we shut those offices down and sent our 500 person workforce home. And what was really incredible to me uh, was over the course of that weekend, uh, from Friday, March 13th to Monday, March 16th, we completely pivoted to a distributed way of working And thanks to the cloud-based tools we use to run Clio, including Clio itself, we didn't miss a beat. And we were able to service our customers. We were able to keep shipping software. And the thing that was really remarkable to me was that the team felt like they were actually more productive than they'd ever been in those early days of the the pandemic. So it was a really eye-opening experience. uh, And pretty quickly, we made the decision that we would shift more permanently to uh, a mode of working that we call distributed by design. And it's this idea that the Clio of the future is going to be far more distributed with far more uh, remote team members. And our offices are going to shift from being a place that mostly everyone works from to a place that instead is a communal gathering place for very focused and intentful meetings and we describe this concept of, of the on-site being the new off-site, for example, which is the idea that you know now you'll work mostly from home and when your team, and that might be your immediate team, it might be uh, a larger department, it might even be the entire company in some cases, when they feel like it's appropriate, you'll get together in one of our physical offices, which we're now describing as hubs. So we pretty quickly shifted to this, this new reality, this new way of working. And, you know, as part of that, that pivot, we've actually found that people are, are able to achieve, you know, a better blend between their personal life and their work life. And despite, you know, obviously the, the myriad challenges that COVID-19 is presenting people as, as a backdrop, we've found that people have responded really positively to this, the shift to distributed by design. And, you know, to this, to this day, seven months into the pandemic, Our worldwide offices remain closed. It's actually just realizing today's the anniversary of of when we sent home and we're recording this uh, on October 13th. And our offices remain closed and our team continues to function uh, at a really high level. 
Yeah, I think I, you know, I went through that a few years ago. I was working out of our Denver office. I had that commute. And I remember when I was finally allowed to go remote and, um, you know, I I moved out to Southern California, you know, lifestyle change uh, for fun and, you know, just that kind of whole balance and everything. I get so much more done. And if I had a traffic jam working from home, it's because I'm on my way to the coffee pot. That's my fault. (laughs) Right, right. It's definitely not for everybody. You know, I know that some people aren't as productive at home. I know I get a lot more done. I've saw my productivity go, you know, sky high during that period of time. So, yeah, I think it's uh, it's interesting. I think that's a key insight when we talk to employees. You really hear the different perspectives and you need to appreciate that there's no one way of working that is best for everyone. You you really understand, you know, some people are extroverts, they're social creatures and and if you think about what working from home is taken away from them. It's all the energy that they get from being around other human beings in the office. And, and similarly, there's people that are more on the introverted side of the spectrum that are relishing every minute of <laughs> uh, COVID-19. So I, I, I think, you know, we're going to maybe not uh, see this mode of working per, be the persistent model beyond COVID-19, but I really think most workplaces, including most law firms, are going to be looking at a reality where their workforces are more distributed than they were before and their use of physical meeting space will be more intentional than it was in the past and not just the the default. Well, I wanted to say congratulations on your podcast. I listened to your 100th episode the other day, actually yesterday, and I wanted to get caught up with you to see what was going on right before the conference got started. But, uh, you know, a lot of organizations, when there's, uh, you know, financial strains, they they retreat, you know, from a tactical point of view into their core competence. And and so they're like, listen, these are the things we do well. This is what we deliver efficiently. We need to trim all the fat. And you all decided to venture out into something right. a little bit new. Uh, you saw an important... Uh, you saw an important task at hand. And I remember you talking about that on the 100th episode. So why was it so important, Jack, for Clio to have a voice during uh, during such a troubled time for the legal profession? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, I, I described our shift to work from home and, 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 you know, essentially addressing what I might describe as the the most basic layer of Clio's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And and we, we had our food, water, and shelter sorted out. And and we made that pivot, as I mentioned, just, just in a handful of days. So once we made that pivot and knew that we had our own affairs in order and we were able to properly service our customers and our employees and so on, we turned our attention out to the industry and said, how can we help the industry navigate this incredible period of change? And we felt like we had a lot to offer. Number one, we had some financial reserves. Uh, you might remember last year, we announced the largest growth equity round in legal tech history. And we had seen you know, a hugely successful year up to that point as well. So we had some financial result reserves available to help out the industry in any way we could. And we also had thought leadership in the sense that we had been operating as a cloud-based company and a highly distributed company for years. In fact, Clio, when we founded Clio back in 2008, uh, our team up until around the 10th or 15th employee was a completely distributed team. Uh, And not everyone knows this little curiosity of Clio's backstory, but we started off as a purely distributed company and only decided to open our first physical office once we really started reaching critical mass. And and so we had, and we've, by the way, over the the last 12 years, maintained a decent number of distributed employees across Western Canada and the the US that have been contributing to Clio over that time. So we felt like we had some know-how when it comes to distributed work. We felt like we had deep technical expertise in terms of leveraging cloud-based tools to collaborate online and felt like we were well positioned to help the industry navigate what we regarded as a demand, an an urgent need to do what we described as a, a mass migration to the cloud. We saw tens of thousands of law firms realizing over the course of just a couple of weeks that they had to move their law practices to the cloud. We saw 10 years or more 
of transformation and digital transformation in legal happen in the space of 10 weeks. And, and we felt like we had to be the helping hand enable that mass migration to the cloud. So we deployed a million dollar COVID-19 relief fund. We launched a historic partnership with the ABA and became the ABA's first ever strategic partner. And we were able to bring both of our respective strengths to bear to help the, the industry navigate this enormous period of change. And we saw the industry responded really positively to that offer of assistance almost. I think the uh, lawyers from solo firms to small firms to some of the biggest firms in the world were looking for a bit of a guiding light in terms of what does this new reality look like and what adaptations do I need to make to survive this crisis? And, and maybe even what adaptations can I make to thrive in this crisis? And, and Clio was able to offer that, that guiding light over the course of the last six months. So I feel, you know, to, to your question, maybe the, the why is really rooted in, I think, our mission. And, you know, those are the things we did to service our mission. But our, our mission is to transform the practice of law for good. And we felt like COVID-19 was a unique opportunity to actually accelerate our ability to realize that mission. Well, I definitely want to get into the mission. There's there's a lot of add-ons to that this year, uh, just just because of the necessity of the remote environment. But uh, a couple of things I wanted to ask you. You know, uh, you're a family man. You know, you've got priorities at home, and uh, you run a very big company, and you've got employees to to look after. Now you've got some investors. You know, so there's a lot of serious decisions that had to be made. And so, obviously, 2020 being a very unusual year because of the circumstances. I was wondering if I could ask you a two part question. Uh, what is the biggest lesson you've learned personally during the course of these events? And what is the biggest lesson you've learned professionally? Yeah, great, great questions. I think for, for me, the, the personal lesson, I'm going to reflect on this for, for a minute. There, there's a lot I feel like I've, I've learned, but maybe the personal lesson for for me, and it's coupled maybe with a professional lesson, is that there's a unique opportunity to do work in a, in a different way than we did in the past that better blends your needs to be you know, a good person at home, whether that's a parent or a partner uh, to, your, to your spouse, or you know, while achieving your professional and business goals. And you know, I, I've seen you on the road lots, Lawrence, over the, over the years. Um, and, you know, I was traveling professionally probably a week of most months in, in the year, which is certainly not as much as some true road warriors. But uh, there's, there's periods of the year where I'd feel like I was getting off one plane, you know, just <laughs> with just enough time to swap the clothes in my, in my roller carry on and, heading back to the airport. And, and there's been days that I've, you know, had one night at home and, and turned around and headed back out on the road again. Um, and that's grueling in a whole bunch of ways. Um, you know, it's tough on your family. It's tough on your, your health. And I, I think, you know, my, my biggest learning across both the personal and professional side is that we, we really, I think, don't need as much travel as we thought we did to, make, to achieve the kinds of interpersonal relationships, the kind of business outcomes that we want to drive. Now, on the flip side, and, and, and this sounds almost like a contradiction in terms, I've also realized that the personal connections and, and the act of being in the same physical space as another human being is something that you cannot replace I agree through with that. a screen. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like that's where we need to be more intentional and more deliberate about when we do have these in-person meetings and do get in the same room, that is what is so crucial and that we should be so focused and deliberate about because it's, there's, there's magic that happens when, when a group of human beings get in a room to create something together. And I've realized that there are inherent limitations to what you can do over 
a Zoom call. And it's good enough for probably nine out of 10 of our professional interactions and for some subset of our personal interactions, but it is no replacement. And I've felt this almost indescribable sense of, of joy when I've been in the company of, of other human beings. And even at CleoCon today in the studio, being in the same room is just a handful of other Cleons for the first time in seven months even though it was socially distanced and even though everyone was wearing masks, it, it made me happy at a really like deep and profound, in a really deep and profound way. And I, I think the true trick that all of us need to navigate over the next several, several years and beyond is finding a new rhythm where we're blending the interactive video tools that we have available to us with very deliberate use of meeting in person when it really matters. Well, I want to transition into your uh, mission statement, and I, and I think well said. I think that's the thing that everybody's missing. I, you know, I definitely miss people, and to the degree I get to hang out with people in person, I very much cherish that. And uh, you know, I will never take it for granted again. You know, having that communal uh, connection with everybody. But, um, but uh, you know, your mission statement, uh, you know, uh, transform the practice of law for good. That double meaning. You know, we're going to transfer it for good purposes, but we're going to do it permanently. And uh, you've added a little bit to that. So you know, now includes how society engages with delivers and experiences legal services and you know to that end you've uh, you've you've come up with some new developments and some new integrations and I want I want to just quickly tackle those so I do have a question for you about uncertainty at the end uh, I think you were maybe I maybe I was reading your mind or maybe we're just uh, in the force together but your uh, your uh, keynote tapped on one point I definitely want to get into before we close it but uh, these uh, these new solutions and integrations there's basically four main components I kind of want to map this out for the listener real quick so connecting clients with lawyers online and this is the uh, encapsulates the entire client journey from right. knowing they need to hire a lawyer to working with a lawyer and then retention of that lawyer. Um, and so the first step is connecting clients with lawyers online. The next step is supporting clients digitally and a very similar step, collaborating and communicating remotely. And the last one is automating and improving collections. And so cannot be understated, you know, out of the value of revenue. So why don't we break those off just one at a time and we'll sure. start with uh, some of the innovations that you all have come up with in terms of connecting clients with their lawyers. Yeah. And, and maybe this is the part of the keynote that uh, one, one of the parts there's, uh, to be honest, every part of the keynote I was, I was pretty excited about. But one of the, I think, most impactful and most exciting uh, things I talked about today was a new integration with Google My Business. And Google My Business, for those of your listeners that might not be familiar with it, is, is basically a digital storefront for your law office and for physical businesses of, of every kind. And when somebody searches on Google looking for, for example, a, a lawyer, a personal injury lawyer in San Diego, the search rankings they'll see are Google My Business search rankings where there's a profile for your law firm that enables ratings, it enables appointments, it enable, it shows basic information like your hours, or hours of operation and a description of your law firm. There's even Q&A functionality in there, for example. So in a lot of ways, the Google My Business feature replaces the need in a lot of cases for the consumer to ever visit your website. And what we've announced is a, a deep integration between Clio and Google My Business that allows you to seamlessly and easily create a Google My Business profile, claim that profile, integrate it directly within Clio, and then connect the scheduling functionality of Google My Business with the scheduling functionality within Clio as well. So with just a few clicks, you don't need to be a marketing expert, you don't need to be an SEO expert, you can light up your Google My Business profile which you can think is almost your, your law firm's welcome mat on the internet. The reason this is so crucial right now is that more than half of all legal consumers are starting their search for a lawyer online. And 86% of those legal consumers are starting their search on Google. So Google is where legal demand is being created today. And those stats, by the way, are all pre-COVID stats. So I don't know what they'll pan out being post COVID, but I would be very surprised if there's not double digit increases in both of those numbers over the course of, of COVID. 
And the end game that we're evolving to, in my mind, is a world where 100% of legal demand is happening online. And the vast majority of that search is going to be happening on Clio. So capturing where your clients are starting to look for a lawyer is crucial to law firms that want to survive or maybe even thrive in a COVID-19 environment. So tapping into that demand through Google My Business is one of the most powerful ways you can do that. Let's uh, let's transition over to supporting clients digitally. I know that clients are uh, increasing their their demand uh, in terms of how they view a good service and their ability to interact and be part of that overall solution that solves their problems. So how is uh, how is Clio improving that process? Yeah. So this was you heard me uh, deliberating between whether Google My Business was my favorite feature announcement at ClioCon or not, and. And, and, and what I was debating in my head about was, was how it ranks up against Clio for Clients, which was another big feature uh, that we announced that, you know, Lawrence, you, you've attended ClioCon for several, several years, and you've heard me talk about this for, for years now, the need for a better client experience. And delivering a better client experience is a, a massively powerful way of differentiating your law firm. But more importantly, it's a massively powerful way to drive your law firm flywheel and to generate clients that are exceptionally happy with the services you delivered to them and to have them, you know, in turn drive more referrals and reviews and so on for your law firm and to drive that that flywheel of growth. So this Clio for Clients application is the first app of its kind. It's a secure app available on both iOS and Android, and it enables you to seamlessly communicate with your clients through this Clio for Clients app. It allows you to have secure messaging back and forth. It allows you to share documents back and forth with your clients. It allows you to uh, assign tasks to your client, invite them to calendar meetings. And importantly for your client, this is a unified hub for all of their communications with your law firm. And, and this is important because just like all of us in this digital world, your clients can easily get overwhelmed with the different communication channels that they might have to engage with your law firm. They might be receiving text messages, they might be receiving emails, they might be getting electronic bills sent to them, they might be receiving letters in the mail, you, you name it. It can be a pretty overwhelming experience. And this is a new unified hub for all the communications with your firm. And it's built from the ground up to be secure. It is encrypted end to end. Your client does not need, and this is crucial, does not need to remember a password for this app. They receive a secure login link via email. And once they've got that login link, they can securely access the app and set up biometric security in the form of touch ID or Android fingerprint or face ID. So that even if their phone gets stolen, for example, their Clio for Clients data remains secure thanks to that biometric security layer. So this, this is a game changer and, and without being too hyperbolic about it, I think it's, it's the most meaningful product release Clio's had in the last couple of years. And it's, it's really, I think, representative of a place we'll be investing aggressively over the next few years to enable clients to collaborate effortlessly with their law firms through a native mobile app. And that is simply put the the future of how legal services will be delivered for the vast majority of consumers. Well, so Jack, I think that kind of covers the collaboration and the communications part of some of the innovations that you all have been doing. But as I've discovered uh, through a couple of conferences and just sort of thinking about it after people have explained it to me, you know, clients don't like getting these giant bills. You know, the way that you're billed and the frequency that you're billed can often really impact that client satisfaction experience. And so what have you all done to really help the uh, your customer, the lawyer, interact with their clients in that way, that, that really crucial, important part of billing? Yeah, great question. And you're, you're right. One, one thing that's important to note is if you think about how the world has changed in the 12 years since we launched Clio back at ABA Tech Show 2008, when we generated bills back then, we generated a paper invoice, we printed that invoice out, we folded it up, we stuffed it in an envelope, we licked a stamp, and we mailed it to our clients. 
our clients in turn, you know, received the invoice, had to hunt around for their checkbook, wrote us a check and send it back in the mail to us. And we'd eventually make a trip to a bank to deposit that check. And here's the, the awful part of that workflow is the average law firm took six months to get an invoice out the door after they'd actually done the work for the client. The average client actually took the better part of six months to send the check back in the mail, maybe sensing the relative lack of urgency around this whole thing. And therefore, law firms were dealing with essentially, you know, a, a year of cash flow that, that they were missing out on from the time they did the work to the time they got paid for the work. The other problem with that workflow and, and waiting so long to send an invoice to your client is, I like to refer back to this concept that Jay Foonberg popularized in, in his, his Bible, uh, How to Start and Build a Law Firm. And he, he talks about the client appreciation curve and the fact that your client is most appreciative and most willing to pay your bill the minute you've delivered their work pro your work product to them. So you've delivered their incorporation documents or you just help them close in their house transaction or close that round of financing with their venture capitalists, whatever the, whatever the work deliverable is, they'll happily pay you the minute you complete that work. But there's this exponential decay in the lawyers or sort of the client's willingness to pay after you've delivered your work product to them. And yet the average lawyer waits six months to send that invoice to their client. So the huge opportunity for lawyers is to be faster in getting their bill out the door, getting smaller, more bite-sized bills to their client if it's a long, long-running work project, to get the bill to the client electronically and to allow for electronic forms of payment. And we have, over the course of the last year, completely rebuilt the Clio Payments platform from the ground up to allow for easy online invoicing, to allow for easy online payment, to allow for innovative new ways of getting paid, like allowing for payment plans, for example, uh, and something we announced at ClioCon today was automated bill reminders. So you can ensure that if your client does let a bill go unpaid, I'm sure by accident for some period of time, you can gently nudge them with an automated email reminder, which by the way, clients take way less offense to than they do a collections agency phoning, for example, which so many lawyers are, <laughs> are reticent to, to hire. And, and lawyers hate and are also awful at doing any form of collection. So if we can automate that and just make this part of the, the Clio billing engine, we'll enable you to get paid faster, we'll allow you to increase your overall collection rate, which for, for law firms is on average only about 80%. And this is the kicker, we'll also allow you to deliver a better client experience because your clients are getting bills faster, which they prefer. They're, they're getting the ability to pay those bills electronically which they prefer, and they're getting gentle reminders to pay those bills if they forget them, which, which they don't mind either. So this is a win-win-win for, for law firms and for clients, and we've seen uh, the, impact, it, the, the impact is just mind-blowing. It, it allows law firms to get paid so much faster than they were previously. And as I'm sure you can appreciate, getting paid is more important today than it's ever been, and allowing for your clients to pay in a more flexible way is more important than it's ever been. I think that's right. I think that uh, definitely the bottom line always helps. So, Jack, I just have one more question for you. And, you know, I had this uh, question written out before before I attended uh, virtually your uh, keynote, and I really like that you addressed this. And so you attacked it from a very robust point of view, and I don't think we have time to get into all of it. But uh, you talked about VUCA and VUCA Prime uh, dealing with uncertainty. And so, you know, VUCA standing for uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And you're supposed to ambigu ambiguity uh, later. The day. You got it. And, uh, and you're trying to transfer <laughs> that. In, that's right. That's right. Uh, trying to transfer that into VUCA Prime, which is vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. And so, the reason I brought this question up, I wanted to ask you about uncertainty. So, you know, you lead a big company and you've had a lot of question marks this year. And obviously, you know, obviously the investment uh, support that you had, you know, helped with that. But, you know, you've, you've had to deal with a lot of people that have had some doubts about their own personal business and their ability to make a living. And I'm sure you've probably had some, uh, some, 
midnight calls from some friends out there in the industry practicing. And so, you know, Jack, if you had just one thing to, uh, one piece of advice to offer somebody that's really stressed out about the uncertainty, you know, maybe a little little bit of a pointer or a tip or or kind of a, a, I don't know, kind of lift their spirit sort of remark, what would you say about uncertainty in dealing with these times? Yeah, great question. And I, I, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe part of the answer is in, in the question as well, in, in that I think the uncertainty that we see in a VUCA environment uh, is best countered and addressed by the tools that VUCA Prime gives us. And as you mentioned, VUCA Prime, you know, gives you the tools of vision, understanding, clarity, and agility to counter the messy, complex, rapidly changing, highly uncertain environment that a VUCA environment represents. And my, my advice would be, you know, number one, go read up and learn about VUCA Prime and how you can apply some of those concepts to your law firm. Read up and understand concepts like anti-fragility and, and how you can actually find ways of translating huge tumultuous periods of change into something that actually makes you stronger. And, it, you know, again, I, I referenced Stephen Jay Gold in the, in the keynote in this concept of a punctuated equilibrium and, and, and the fact that this evolutionary process that the legal industry is going through is, is representative of the, the punctuation that the macro environment of COVID-19 is placing on the industry as a, as a stressor. And I really think we're going to see speciation happening in the legal industry in the sense that there's going to be lawyers that understand the new world, understand the dynamics of how to run a law practice that thrives in a post-COVID world. And there's going to be the law firms that grasp onto what used to be and hope that at some point things will return to normal. And, and to that lawyer that is, is, is maybe feeling overwhelmed by all of the uncertainty, my, my takeaway message would be there is opportunity in periods of change like this it's an opportunity to experiment and to try new things. You've got more permission than ever from everyone, including your clients, to experiment in ways that you've never done before. Clients are trying new things and expecting new things from every service provider that they deal with, including lawyers. Your fellow lawyers and the, the partners in your law firm, the professional staff you work alongside every day, are also more malleable and more adaptable and more willing to change than you might expect. So find ways of finding, you know, opportunity, embrace a client centered mindset when you're thinking about how to meet the needs of the modern legal consumer and the legal consumer that is also having to navigate these enormously challenging times. And by taking that VUCA prime mindset and coupling it with a client centered design thinking, you'll be able to find a way of thriving in this period of change. Well, we've reached the end of the road for this episode here today, but I want to thank our guest, Jack Newt, for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. And listeners, also, thank you for tuning in. We hope you like this program. And if you did, you know, please leave us a rating in your favorite podcasting app. It's always good for the show. We'll see you next time for another episode of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS, find us on Twitter and Facebook, or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Consult a lawyer.